a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very good. Erweitere deine Realität. Spanning reality. Motherfucker out there. Daniel Beckman, welcome to this motherfucking show right here. I am so excited that you're joining me. Uh, all the ways to find Daniel, this amazing, beautiful man right here, will be located down in the show dig diggity description. Description? Description. Show description. That's it. Um, thank you, Brandon, for having me. Um, I'm very pumped to talk to you today because I love expanding reality and I listen to your show whenever I can find the time. Um, for example, when I walk through the woods with my dogs, I love to listen to your voice and to your interesting guests. I really dig your show and people um, tune into Brandon's show. Um, yeah, like you said, my name is Daniel Beckman. I am from Germany, Bavaria, Germany. I'm 43 years old and I'm the host of Flying Chariots the Rice. And also, I have also another podcast, a German project, which is called Sagenhaft und Sonderbar, which is translated, um, you can translate it to uh, fabulous and strange, maybe. And we talk about, yeah, UFOs there, the paranormal, um, consciousness, all the crazy stuff. And um, yeah. It's been a wild ride since I started the podcast. I get to know a lot of interesting people. I had the chance to talk to a lot of interesting people. Some of them are very well known, like Eric von Daniken, for example, or Avi Loeb. There was, there was a, a treat to talk to these guys, especially since Eric von Daniken is, uh, I think, 86 already or 87 and... Yeah, that was a treat to get to know him in person. Also, Avi Loop, who is very interesting, very scientific, but very interesting. But um, yeah, I'm not only into the <laughs> famous guys. I, I talk to book authors, um, normal people who tell me their stories, the paranormal experiences or what they found out, maybe. Some people talk about UFO sightings, UFO abductions, about um we, we talked about the inner earth <laughs> reptilians and whatnot uh, reptiloids it's yeah it's crazy but it's cool and i love it well i gotta say man the work that you do is fascinating and awesome and we met uh you invited me on we had a wonderful episode which it will be linked down in the show description so my guest spot over there will be linked but also dude you and i have been doing a co-host thing which is really cool that aggie nost uh, Augie Noss episode that we had was super fucking awesome, man. Talking about the Nazi crafts and Germany's Roswell and all this kind of shit, dude. You do, like I said, some amazing work. So again, Flying Chariots, The Rise will be located down below. So as your few, uh, Facebook there and all the other ways to find you, dude. So uh, there's so much to cover here with you. And uh, since you and I have been hanging out, I've just been blown away with the amount of information that comes out of that side of the world that I had no idea about. And blame it on our ignorance, only studying you know, Roswell for the past 20 years and wanting to hear what new people have to say about the same shit. But I, I find it really interesting the things that you've introduced me to, which is why I'm grateful as a brother to introduce you to the audience here and to let them know the man behind um, sort of this co-host thing that we've been doing, but also uh, to let them know about some crazy cool shit that you've been telling me about, not only your part of the world, but other parts of the world that I've never even heard of. So guys, you're in for a real treat on this one. Daniel Beckman, it's so cool to see you, man. So where do you want to start, man? Well, uh, if you don't, if you want, I can start maybe with my story because I have experience with the UFO two, and that was back in nineteen ninety six when I was only sixteen years old. 
Um, yeah, that's where my story, my journey essentially begins. Well, I had an experience earlier, but, but I can talk about that a little bit later in the show. Um, yeah, 1996, it was summer and my back then girlfriend and I decided to sleep in a tent in the garden in front of her house. Unfortunately, a uh, schoolmate joined us. <laughs> His name is David. I remember that, but he will become important in the story later on. At some point in the night, uh, we were laying on a blanket in front of the tent, gazing at the sky. And suddenly our schoolmate, he was, uh, he jumped up and he was screaming, look, look, what's that? What's that? Look in the sky. And uh, we turned our eyes to the sky and it took a moment to, to see what he meant. And then, and then we saw it. It was a large, motionless triangle in the sky. And it didn't move an inch. It was just standing there and it was very impressive because it was, um, it appeared to be very close. It wasn't really big, but it appeared to be very close. And I can, I cannot tell you how large it was, but uh, because back then I didn't really pay much attention uh, because I was quite startled from what we saw. But uh, it was clearly recognizable as a triangle and it was dark. I don't know if it was black or blue, something like that. It was dark. It was not shiny at all. In the center, there was a light that didn't blink. It only glowed. It only was had the lights on, so to speak. And um, there was no sound. I remember that. There was no sound whatsoever. And you couldn't detect any propulsion system. So I don't know how it moved. <laughs> but it did. We observed uh, we observed the triangle for a while and suddenly it made uh, a movement from, I think, from right to left or left to right, doesn't matter, in a straight line. And I would estimate it covered the distance of about two football fields. So, And it happens so fast that it was barely, uh, you could barely see it with the naked eye. Um, we were completely startled and uh, we looked at each other and then it made another movement. This time it was a, a kind of a zigzag or a C pattern. And it also happened in the, in, in the fraction of a second. So we were blown away by what we saw. We were scared. And when the second <laughs> movement happened, we ran inside the house. We closed the doors, we closed the windows, we closed the blinds, the curtains, we closed everything. And we even closed our eyes, I think. And um, yeah didn't look out the, the window again that night we were we weren't even talking much about it we talked for it about it a few for a few minutes and then uh we we ended the topic we we didn't discuss it uh, throughout the whole the, the whole night but uh, it was very interesting and it's uh, stuck with me ever since it's wild and it it reminds me of the story you were telling me about when you were 10 years old if you don't mind that breathing ghost thing oh, dude oh damn Please, yeah. it seems like you're a magnet for this kind of stuff. I, I want to add uh, to the first story, to the UFO story, that uh, I really wish um, that back then girlfriend later become, became my wife. And we never talked about it to this day. Now she's my ex-wife. <laughs> she's my ex-wife now, but we have a, we, we, we have a good understanding. We, we like each other and uh, we have kids together. They, all, they already left the house. They're adults. But... Um, yeah, we've never talked about it. And I am really curious um, to ask her about the the incident. If she if you still remember, if she even care what she thinks about it now, because she never talked to me about it. And I don't know whether whether back then friend is my, my, our colleague. I don't know where he uh, where he is uh, these days. I would love to talk to him, too. And, and uh, yeah, listen to his side of the story. But like I said, there was another experience when I was only 10 years old. Um, I was I was laying in my in my bed in my room. My parents sent me to bed and I was listening to uh, a cassette <laughs> to get cassette tapes with my with my um, Walkman. It was a red Walkman. I know that I remember that. And it was a, uh, a He-Man cassette, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. It's very important to add that to the story because I love He-Man, fucking love He-Man, man. Um, and when the cassette was, was over, the story was over, I set the device aside and I tried to sleep. Um, however, I wasn't tired, so I stared at the ceiling and some stuff went through my mind, various things. And um, at the foot of the bed, there was my, my window hidden uh, by, the, by the sloping ceiling, but I could clearly see the bright 
light, the bright, yeah, bluish light of the moon shining um, onto the wardrobe opposite the window. And at some point, I became aware of that of a, of a, of a strange sound that was very unfamiliar to me. It was a very strange sound, and you know that in in your house, you know all the sounds, you know all, you know everything, and if something changes, your senses sharpen. And then you listen closely, and I listened closely, and I recognized that it was uh, yeah, it was a breathing, breathing noise. Someone was breathing in my room, and I, I was like, "What the fuck, man? Someone, someone is breathing, and it's not me." Um, it was a very calm, almost breathing, almost if, as if someone else in the room were sleeping peacefully, sleeping, deep breathing, long breath, and yeah. Couldn't be something else. There was nothing in my room. No TV, no no stereo, nothing. Somebody was fucking breathing in my room, man. And I was scared to shit. Well, it's terrifying. It's yeah. terrifying. Yeah. So it terrifying. what do you what do you think it was? Man, since there was only me, um, and the sound was coming from the corner of uh, where, where my wardrobe was, and um I hid under my blanket and occasionally I was peeking out and uh, every few minutes I was peeking out and uh, I listened into into the into the night if the breathing was still there and it was there and it was there until I uh, eventually fall, fell asleep and I, I tried to get up and, and run to the door and maybe go to my parents but I was scared first uh, of, of their reaction when I when I say I have some breathing in my room I, I knew my father he, he I think he <laughs> He would say something like, um, uh, yeah, fuck off. And, um, and so, and I was scared. Second of all, I was scared. I was very scared. I was very scared. What uh, would, what would happen if I get up from the bed, you know, boogeyman below the bed, grabbing me by my foot, pulling me under the bed, something like that. I was like nine or 10, like I said, yeah, you have thoughts like that. I was very scared. So I didn't get up and I, uh, fell asleep and, um, Next day, I told my best friend about it, who was my neighbor, and he laughed at me. <laughs> he said, you're an idiot. And it took me a few days to tell my mother about what has happened in my room. And when I told her, she said something crazy. Um, it was not the response I expected. She told me that I shouldn't be afraid. In that room, my great-grandmother has passed away, and she was a very kind of a woman. And yeah, maybe it was her. Don't be afraid. Oh. Don't be afraid to what she said. Maybe it's her, but she would never harm you. Yeah, that's not what you want to hear when you're nine or 10 years old. No, the ghost exists. It's probably your grandma, which you, you know, maybe had notoriously bad breath. And she's over there trying to white noise you to sleep. That's awful. That's yeah. crazily terrifying, dude. How old was that house? Actually, when I was nine or 10, that house, I was born in, in 1980. My father and my grandfather built this house with their own hands. It was it was something seventy. Was not old uh, when I was when that happened. So maybe 10, 15 years, something like that. Damn. If I would guess, yeah. Just long enough for great grandma to die in and then haunt you. Yeah. Damn, dude, that's rough. You, bitch. <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks a lot. I didn't. I didn't. I have, I never seen her. I, I don't know who she was, uh, obviously. But yeah, my mother said she was a nice person. So yeah, um, crazy. The craziest thing is, um, I don't know what it was, but for a very long time, I have no recollection of uh, the nights following that one night in that room. I do not remember how the subsequent nights unfolded. Um, whether I was scared or not, or if I even slept in that room, I, I don't know. I can't remember. I, I don't I have no recollection of the nights uh, after that in that room. That is crazy. I remember what I did throughout the days, and I remember that I uh, was a lot. A lot of times I was in my room and I and I played and I did my homework and stuff like that. But I have no recollection of the nights after that night. I don't know if I was lying in my bed scared or. Slept peacefully. I don't know. I have no idea what happened uh, throughout the nights in that room. It's really bizarre. Yeah, maybe she had some sort of deal on the other side where she could like sort of hop in your body and run around and do whatever she wanted for like a week after you hear the breathing. Like some yeah. weird shit, probably some fuckery kind of a thing. I don't know, man. It's really odd. Do you get a do you get a weird sense about it? Yes. 
it's crazy. Um, yeah. Sometimes I, I, from nine to 13, I suffered from severe uh, sleep paralysis. And I, I really don't know if that has something to do with it. I, maybe I was in a, in a strange state of sleep paralysis because you, you might know it. And you of your, uh, many of your listeners also might know that in, uh, when you have sleep paralysis, you can, um, have hallucinations and not only visual hallucinations, but you can hear things and you even can, uh, have the, the sense of somebody's touching you. And those can be very strange. So I don't know, maybe something like that happened to me because I, like I said, I suffered uh, from severe uh, cases of sleep paralysis uh, from nine to 13 many nights and you've experienced paranormal in your house for, like how how recently has paranormal have gone on around you i maybe i just uh, didn't notice it <laughs> but in, in the house where i live now uh my wife and me we experienced uh, something strange uh, let's say eight or nine years ago when we heard steps coming from upstairs uh, for a few weeks in a row, uh, every night, almost the same time, we heard very heavy steps coming from upstairs and we went upstairs and we looked everything on nothing. And we even sent, sent the dog upstairs. They also sensed nothing. I don't know what, what that was, but that, uh, that went away, that, that was that gone away um someday and never happened again after that and i remember two um two nights when i in the one night i stood up here from from my desk and i went to the kitchen to have a glass of water before i went to bed and it was uh, one or two in the night and i opened the kitchen door turned on the light and when i looked at the sink i saw this little knife laying on the sink and it turned like a compass needle and suddenly stopped. Boom. Um, so first I thought, because I'm a skeptic, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic. In, in my German podcast, <laughs> a lot of people don't, don't like me because I'm a skeptic and I, I need proof, 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 proof. I, I believe that everything is possible, but I would like to have some proof too. So I, I thought, okay, maybe it was the window, maybe air or something or, or from opening the door but the door was i don't know three or four meters is the door is away from the sink so it wasn't the door windows were closed then i thought maybe it was a mouse a mouse was on the sink and when i turned the light it ran away and turned the knife but the knife fucking stopped it was a, like a turned slowly like a compass needle so it wasn't propelled by the by the mouse running away it uh, turned slowly and then stopped so that was crazy uh, but I haven't thought about thought much about it since then, man. Why why break your head over things you can't explain, right? And um, another night, a few weeks after, I think same uh, scenario. I got up from from podcasting, uh, went upstairs to the bathroom, um, turned the key around. That's what I always do because I have kids. And this is muscle memory <laughs> because you want to have a little bit of peace when you go to the bathroom. And I was washing my hand uh, uh, in the sink and I um, saw that the, the door handle went down like this slowly and up again. And we have, uh, this house is from 1860 or something like that. And we have very, those original doors are still installed, old doors with old handles and with big springs inside. So if you, if you, um, pull the door handle down and let go, it goes snap with a loud click. And yeah, I thought, who was that? First I thought maybe the cat jumped on the door handle, but then we would hear that loud click uh, when it let go. But uh, immediately went to the door, uh, turned the key around, opened the door and, and called my daughter and, and said, do you have to go to the toilet? But uh, no response. I went to her room. She was laying in her bed, sleeping, sleeping sound, snoring. And I went to my stepson's uh, room. He's also um, sleeping. And my wife was also sleeping. So I don't know what happened, <laughs> what happened there, but it freaked me out a little bit, but just a little bit. Um, I was already living in that house for uh, about 10 years when that happened. And I said to myself, whatever it is, and if there's something, uh, a spirit or something uh, playing tricks on me, 
I live with it now for 10 years plus. Fuck it. I don't care. <laughs> as long as it's not uh, harming me in any way, just playing some tricks on me, I don't care. Yeah, if you're not being poltergeists out of your bed or finding scratches or anything, if every now and then it just sort of reminds you that it cares about you by jiggling a handle, I suppose, then, I mean, yeah, in retrospect, if we're talking comparatively, sure. Wow. Yeah, that was crazy, man. I tell you that. Crazy. I, I had this, uh, I don't know if I, if you already talked about it, uh, maybe when we had a talk for my channel, but um, this was one of three things that happened. And after that, uh, nothing happened. Um, the last thing that happened was when I saw this strange, let's call it shadow figure. Let's call it shadow figure. Um, I was about to go to bed. It was late, also one or two in the night, or maybe even later. It could be, could be three. But there's something to three o'clock. People say, you know, right? I, I don't know what I can't remember, but something, something is about that time. So, um, I was, I was about to go upstairs, and uh, we have this long hallway. Um, and at the end of this hallway, I saw a strange, yeah, a shadow. I recognized a shadow when I was looking along, looking, uh, what's that, what's that? And it, it occurred to me as, um, it appeared to me as humanoid. I saw no eyes, I saw no arms, no legs or so, but it was humanoid, a humanoid um, shadow. And it scared me. And I went upstairs, went to bed, and when my back touched the mattress, it was like click and I woke up and I was confused and I, and I, and I thought, man, was I sleeping? Was I dreaming or did that really happen? It took me a few minutes to realize that I was in bed already for an hour or so. And, uh, but it felt as real as we're talking to each other right now. This is how real it felt. I really, it, it was as if it really happened. I don't know if it was some kind of, let's say, astral travel or something like that. I, I don't practice that. I don't, I don't know how to do it, but maybe it was something like that. But it was, uh, yeah, it felt very real. And it scared me. It almost feels sometimes in this reality that you could wake up from it in any moment, like you just said, and you're really like asleep in some other completely different reality that when you wake up, you realize that this was a dream. It's almost like this place, you continue to sort of dream deliberately every single time or that you're sort of bound to this reality when that body sleeps and vice versa. When this body sleeps, you're active in that one and maybe that's what this crossover is, is that you're really acting in two capacities. It's like they say, you know, this idea that consciousness never rests, right? Your body needs rest, but your consciousness doesn't. It just kind of zips off and does whatever. Well, that kind of leaves open a lot for interpretation, right? So what happens? Like, does something hop in me? Do I get an upgrade every night? Do I like just achieve some sort of level of awareness in the dream every night so that a higher version of me can wake up in a new one every day kind of a thing? And then you talk about like this tampering with your dreams and with your body, the sleep paralysis kind of a deal where you sort of are your consciousness uh, lagging in getting back in the body, but your body's aware that it's a body and it needs to be animated, but it can't because the soul or whatever, you know, the animating force is off somewhere, just kind of stuck in traffic and on its way or still battling some dope demon in another realm. And then it'll hop on in a second. And that's sort of this time period. But there's so many speculative ideas about this. And like you, I don't practice astral travel as, as well. I haven't had a triangle craft or poltergeist craft, or, you know, uh, events or anything like that. But I, like you, am a skeptic. I uh, like you also feel that everything is possible. We line so so much in the way that we talk about things because we're excited about all of it. It's just I want to see it. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, so to that point, man, I'm um, like I said earlier, you know, a shitload of stuff about that part of the world. And so I'm curious about some of the superstitions, legends and things like that uh, in Germany. Like, tell us about some stuff that you know, we, we don't know about Germany and we've heard a lot. Um, usually it has to do with a dude in a little mustache, but there's so much more that that country has to offer. And it's history is fascinating in some degrees. So talk to us more about what Germany has to offer, except for Hitler. Yes, I would love to, I, I, I love the topic, but let me add something to uh, the, what you just said. You said something interesting. You, um, when we sleep, our mind goes to God knows where. Um, I heard a very interesting podcast not too long ago, but I 
do not remember which podcast it was, unfortunately, and I can't find it since then. Um, I heard this uh, woman say she's convinced that when we sleep, we go home. We go into our reality. This is the, the this is the reality where we go when we sleep. We are this here. We are visiting this here where we at right now. This is not the reality. So when we sleep, we go home. And she said, "Do you do you know the feeling when you're daydreaming? When you when you when you just standing there staring holes in the air, and you're gone for ten seconds or, or what?" and your mind is completely empty. Where are you in that in that moment? She said. Where are you? Right in that moment. Where are you? When you're daydreaming. When you're when you're sta just staring and somebody's uh, standing and, and tipping on your shoulder and says, "Hey, hey, what's what's wrong? What's wrong? Where are you in that moment?" She said. You're going home for a second. You're going home where you come from. Your mind is going home. This is not the reality. And I, I don't know. <laughs> If I if I want to believe that, but I I love the thought. To be honest, I really do love the thought that that this is not the reality. This is just something that is created by someone, something I don't know, whatever you want to call it. But I love the thought. I'm somewhere with you uh, on it as well. Of course, that sounds dope and sh dope as shit, right? Like that idea of Bashar saying that um, you never leave heaven, but you dream that you do. And in this case, to what you're saying there confirms that in that in that sense that you're going home when you're not here. So the only place to go is home. But then when you are not at home, you're visiting here, meaning that you're dreaming from home to here. So it is interesting when you look at it from that perspective, and I, like you, uh, agree that it's a nice sentiment, and I would love to embody that as well. Uh, there's some interesting observations of mine that counter, I guess, the seamless integration of that fact into my conscious awareness, you know what I mean? Like, I would like to remember it when I'm daydreaming, and instead of, like, whatever I'm doing to blank out, I run home real quick. I'd like to know these touch-in points and what, what that is and what this is at a deeper level. I think that it would... I mean, like anyone, it would help you navigate the game better. It would help you enjoy this place and live live it to your fullest a little bit better if you, I feel, if you're aware of like how this, what this is, what this place really is. And like with conversations like this, with the shows you do and with ideas like that specifically, this is where we expand those, I guess, realms of what's possible where you're sitting here saying, well, what if it is just a damn dream? And, you know, this is basically like a game, right, that you're playing the issue is, is that it feels so fucking real and there's a bunch of shit here we don't like. And so it's like, what's the point of the game if that's, if it's, if a lot of it sucks, you know, to a large degree. That's true. That's true. What's the point of the game? Think about, or I thought about it a lot. And I think people talk about the meaning of life. Um, I don't think there is a real meaning. Just make the best of it for yourself. And the only use is that it's for yourself, that you feel good. And maybe when you die, you die with a good feeling. But I don't think there's a real meaning. There is, I don't think there is something that you have to achieve uh, to, I don't know, to feed a, some kind of process up there, wherever there is. So, yeah. But I want to add something else before we get into, <laughs> into legends and superstitions. Sorry, guys. No, I love it. No, this is a conversation. This is how this happens. These little side roads always take us to the most fascinating place. So I will not allow you to apologize for it, sir. Yeah. Something, as you said, um, made me think about this, uh, this guy here in Germany. There's a, there's a scientist here in Germany who is very well known. His name is Walter von Lukadu. Dr. Dr. Walter von Lukadu. Um, pretty well known here, like I said. He researches paranormal phenomena and he has debunked many of uh, these alleged phenomena as uh, an entirely natural causes. Often it is like that. Um, however, sometimes there are things that are difficult to explain, especially when objects uh, seem to move or on their own or pictures fall from the wall, stuff like that. Sometimes people levitate. I heard stories about people levitating. That's, in that's interesting. And um, Dr. von Lukadu believes that these occurrences often happen to young people going through puberty or facing challenge challenging psychological situations in their life. Like imagine now we're now we're adults, we're grown up, and imagine being 15 years old, 
and your parents separate or being 15 years old, your, your grandfather that you love died or your, or one of your parents or, or brother, whatever, or, or you lose a leg, well, whatever traumatic stuff. So, um, he thinks in, in these, uh, stages of life or situations, stressful situations, um, he's convinced that energy can materialize from the inside out, potentially triggering such phenomena. Uh, of course, there's much, the story is very complex. He, ex he can explain it very well. I can't, sorry. I just can give you a very short version of it. That's his theory that in stressful situations like that, energy can materialize and can move things and uh, sometimes create noise maybe. And that's an interesting thought because if you look at stories of haunted houses, not always, not always, all the ghost hunters are screaming now and picking up the forks already, but it's, it's, it's often, and I, and not, not only young people in the pew, in, 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 in this, uh, stressful, uh, uh, stage of their life, but sometimes older people too, who are at the end of their life. But, um, yeah. We have a lot of stories about haunted houses where kids are involved. Kids, teenagers are involved in when it comes to paranormal cases, poltergeist activities, stuff like it. Often, not always, kids, teenagers and stuff or, or elder, elderly people at the end of their life are involved. And this is why I like the idea, because um, you can you can make out a pattern if you really look for the pattern. You can see a pattern. It's interesting in the sense that now you think that you just want to take your nephew, you know, ghost hunting with you because you're going to have better odds than just a bunch of like a sausage fest, you know, with a bunch of cameras that are in their middle, you know, middle aged dudes or whatever that are running around with the discovery uh, film crew. It, it's interesting to note the time. And then it's also whenever you talk about this powerful explosion coming out around the time that they're around sexual maturity, which is puberty. Then also this in the comics, and yeah, I'm talking about comics, guys, it all comes back to that. That's when, you know, the X-Men got their powers is around the time that they hit puberty. And that's about the time that Scott Summers had to wear glasses in high school because he didn't know he was turning into Cyclops and how to deal with it and shit. And so it is around that time of sexual maturity, which is interesting as well in these young adults. Another thing, too, that stressful situations, as you said, said yes, back to comics again, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going give to it, give it to DC for a minute how Superman got his powers or realized that he was powerful was around that age of maturity in a stressful situation. He was like running or something like that. I think he was sad, a few depictions about it, but either way, he got his powers or realized them, this inner power that then was propelled outward to be a superpower after harnessed after these really stressful situations. So it's interesting that you talk about this and in conjunction to when we talk about how this is an energy harvesting place and that we're like little batteries, maybe that there's some of us, um, or maybe this is a period of time where we're all upgrading or upgrade dead. And now our power sources are, I don't know, going off a little bit. Maybe they're kind of going haywire or maybe there's some sort of bloodline thing to this to where a few of us at some point in our lives, maybe get these crazy emanations of energy in some form. They'd write it up as a superpower in a comic book, but really like it makes Wi-Fi signals go down and turns lights out and shit like that. And you've heard of people turning street lights off and stuff. Usually teenagers is who do this. And that's interesting that you point out the age group. And then also the fact that old people, do you think it's like you said, because they're so close to death and that there's really uh, a thinning of the veil so much more with them? I think sometimes often people are very cool with the, with the thought that they are dead soon. It sounds hard, mm. but you know what I mean. Um, but um, sometimes people do not want to die and they clinch on their life like to the last breath, um, literally. And um, maybe with those people who really do not want to go and maybe are sick already, um, there's such a deep inner fear that stuff like that uh, occurs. I, I I think so. I really do think so. And yeah, I am there. But but still, there is haunted mansions where cameras have recorded such phenomena and there was not one person present. We have to keep that in mind too. Nevertheless, yeah. I believe that humans can, to a large extent, 
um, trigger such things or as mentioned open their third eye so to speak to discover these phenomena i i remember this russian woman it was in the 70s or 80s maybe someone has the name maybe you have the name i i the name i can't i can't remember the name right now i, I talked about her a few days ago and she discovered her she was pretty famous uh, in, in, when it when when it all happened 70s 80s i don't know 80s i think in the 80s i don't remember the name man sorry but um she she had this strange powers which she can move things and scientists brought her in <laughs> and uh, made experiments with her so they had this uh glass uh thing that they put over matches and she was able to move matches she was moving her hands like this over the the glass and it was so exhausting for her to to move uh, a little match that she tried it for i don't know 30 minutes 20 minutes and she moved it a little bit and then she had to rest for two or three hours before she ha could make the next test so th that's how exhausting it was but long story short she discovered her uh psi powers when she was fighting with her husband and um she was she sat on a on a on a table and her husband um he came in i think and they had a, a big fight and she was very angry and um she got up and opened the door and when she opened the door to to go outside or inside the room i don't i don't remember um something fell fell from the wall and it was not from the from the wind from the door or so she moved and she immediately she knew that was me i moved it my anger so to speak my anger i was so angry that i that I, my energy bundled and moved this object and that's how she discovered and that's when she started experimenting uh, moving things and stuff and she did and yeah she was pretty famous back then for moving objects yeah but it's interesting that there's something to the component of anger like that passion or this anger you need to be sort of shaken into this uh, survival uh sort of mode to just freak out and then unleash these powers like what's up with that it's sort of like do you think it has to do with like the kundalini or anything like that could be kundalini very interesting i had a guest talking about kundalini um but when we had the episode i didn't realize uh, what interesting topic it was <laughs> but i think that anger especially anger is a very powerful emotion very very powerful and um hate it or love it what i say now but i think that anger is the most powerful emotion it's more powerful than love i mean love is also powerful right we love can change so much and if you love someone it's it, it's it's it, it, uh, yeah very um i don't know how to put it in words but you know what i mean love is very strong but i think anger is, is the stronger emotion it's not the better emotion, but it's a stronger emotion. And I do believe if you're very angry, that energy really can build up more. Because love, um, if you love someone or you fall in love with someone, it, it happens slowly, 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 slowly. You, and then you're, you're in love with someone and then you, first you like someone, then you're in love and then you love someone with, with, throughout the month or years. And then you, then you love each other and love goes away. Everybody knows that love um, vanishes a little bit throughout the years. If you with a person for many years, a little bit of the love goes away, right? It is what it is. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can take that as a fact, but uh, not always, but it, it is what it is. Um, yeah, but anger explodes in a second. Like you see something and rah, what the fuck? The dog shit on the floor. Fuck you. Let me kill that fucker. And this is this is why why anger is so is, is such a strong emotion. And uh, I think, yeah, things like that happen when you're angry or when you um very scared, very scared. So yeah, yeah. And and this is the idea of a behind the adrenochrome and all this kind of nasty shit that they're talking about about terrifying children. And that's how they get the most uh, the best harvest. And same thing with this energetic idea that you really you're just a battery for some 
luge farm, right? You're a component in this luge farm uh, that really like the more terrified or the more stressed out you are or worried or any of those things, you're committing that version of energy to the system. And that's the most palpable to continue to run the system, which is fascinating. I mean, it's a shit. Um, it's unfortunate, I think, from our perspective, I suppose, that that's, you know, the way that it's uh, calibrated to run, you know, and calibrated to spit energy out or to have the energy be induced. It's just a weird, a weird fucking place, man. And I'm glad you talked about Dr. Dr. Walter uh, there because I wanted to uh, discuss him a little bit with you as well. And it's just a fascinating, um, fascinating folks that you find out there, like I said, with the, with the stories that you have that we don't have access to. Yeah, he's very interesting. And he, I think he speaks a pretty good English. <laughs> Maybe you can invite him. Um, um, what I was about to say. Um, all these psi powers, let's call it psi powers. I think if we only knew how to concentrate our energy on our free will, we would be able to do things that um, early people were able to. I believe that. I believe that people maybe hundreds and thousands years ago, were able to do all these things just by wanting to do them. I think, I really do think, um, I, I believe we already discussed this matter, you and I, uh, where, where we talked about the idea. And um, man, I'm going off topic now. I want to talk about superstition, but, but we talk about it later. Um, we'll come back. I got it written down. Please go where you want to go. Yeah, think about, um, comes to my mind is, the, the pyramids. Think about the pyramids worldwide, not only the Egyptian pyramids. Uh, consider structures created in times when there were only, let's, let's look at uh, Egypt, copper. Copper tools were available. C copper tools or even less. Yeah. yeah. And now one has to examine how precisely the stones were placed on top of each other and how some things are fucking perfectly angled. And polished, also polished, polished that motherfucker. It's it's not that easy with the things you have uh, to do it. Um, can all of that be explained by very good craftsmanship? I don't think so. You know, I I don't think so. I believe that these early humans knew or <coughs> sorry or possessed something that we have lost. Um. Alternatively, they might have had, maybe they had assistance from external sources. People believe that um, that's also a possibility. Of course, uh, this might explain uh, the keen interest in the stars that some civilizations on Earth had uh, at a very early stage. Um, yeah, but. <laughs> what if we're the dumb, we're the dumb ones? And really, like, it's a case of entropy, as we, you know, see in a lot of structures is just that we have gotten dumber where, but though that's the Dunning Kruger effect to where the really intelligent people are kind of quiet about it and maybe are a little passive, but the ones who are raving lunatics are the ones that are raving and loud and the loudest about it. And one would say probably running the show here. So it's interesting that it, it seems to me, uh, in a lot of other uh, examples of that, especially when you're talking global civilizations like that, that a high technology and therefore a high understanding of what it was like to work with those materials, what the earth had to offer, what those technologies could do. I think they were doing a lot with sound and frequency, which I know you've talked about. So it's, um, it's a fascinating thing to think how the story goes with us, because how I see everything in our current time is a complete inversion, damn near a complete inversion of reality. And so whenever they say human was like this, and I say they in air quotes, you know, the lizard turds kind of running the show here. The, the ones presenting the information as fact is how I'll put it. I don't think they're really running shit. Um, but if you look back and they're saying, hey, this is, this is how things were, that's where I sort of go, well, if you flip that on its head, then things look a lot more interesting and look a lot more accurate to what we see here as a de-evolved species rather than one that was that is on the rise and at our technological peak. I think um, we're rediscovering, we're attempting to rediscover that technology and doing a shit job at it, honestly. Or it's been discovered and the real shit's being hidden from us by giving us this cardboard copy of nonsense. Yes, you're absolutely right. I, I, I'm very sure that people back then could do all that stuff. People, scientists, some scientists, not all scientists, of course, you always have to mention that there are scientists out there that 
uh, are sure that our pineal gland was a lot of lot of bigger back then like double the size or even more and yeah what could that have to do with it that's very interesting too also very very interesting it's so fascinating and then when you talk about just structure of reality so if they're saying that it's a ball okay i can kind of look at that it's probably not if they're saying that it works like this i can probably look backwards from that and literally reverse engineer you go from the points that they're telling you things are at and then just turn around and look the other direction and go that way and it's really interesting again when you sort of start start doing that even to history or his story because we know the victors are the ones that get they get to tell that tale and that's all it is it's just a story it, and a lot of it does not match our observation of reality especially some of the stuff they're finding buried underground or these buildings that go stories underground uh that have looked like especially in old photos that they've been excavated but they'll find these things today you you dig down for to fix a sewer line and then all of a sudden you realize that there's a there's a stoop with windows and doors and it's just been filled in with the street it's not even street yeah. levels been the second floor it's it's just interesting when you start looking at this stuff and what this place may be and that maybe there's these resets that occur here that where the technology was in a different place and then they flood the place out with mud and then whatever's left over gets its crack at it, but it's a step down, like a massive step down. And then they flood the bitch out with mud again and the pyramids just happen to stick around because they were built really well by the first motherfuckers that knew what they were doing, not this step down society in which we find ourselves. And then some people talk about this being like after the tribulation, like that we've already fucked up with Jesus. He's already come and gone. And that earlier civilization was building all the dope temples and shit. That's, that's done. Like we're done with that. You know, it's just weird. Yeah. It's interesting. Talking about Tartaria, for example. Yeah. 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 You're a, you're a kind of close, you're way closer to it than we are. I mean, what do you think of all that stuff? I, it's possibility. I, I do believe that uh, it existed and I do believe that civilizations existed on planet earth um maybe way before the dinosaurs um came up and um I, I really do believe i mean we don't have proof right since it's very very fucking long ago and nothing is left and um yeah and we forgot people say we simply forgot we because we're getting dumber and dumber of course let me let me take um, a little uh, side road here. The younger generation is growing up in a virtual environment. I see it, my stepson, my daughter, my daughter, my, my youngest daughter was 12. My older kids are uh, 21, 23. They also grew up with cell phones and PlayStation and, and I don't know, fuck me. Um, I had a fucking Game Boy when I was 18 or 19 years old and I love to play Pokemon Yellow, but I love to go outside and do fucking shit outside. I love to play Ninja in the woods and uh, shit like that, you know? I still do that, I, yeah. I don't want to, and I don't want to uh, rant about younger people because they're <laughs> the last ones who are, uh, uh, um, it's not their fault. I had my first cell phone when I was 18 years old. It was 1998. Something about that. It was a Nokia. Uh, it was a fucking brick. <laughs> and um, I love. I also loved it. But I, the only thing we could do on the thing was uh, standing it. Could it send an SMS back then? I don't know. It could send I SMS. I think it did text. I can't remember. But it had that snake game on it. Yeah, snake. It was Nokia 5110 or something. But I don't know. It was. I loved it. I loved it. I was proud of my fucking cell phone. And But it didn't ring because nobody was calling me because it was very expensive. So... Most of the time, I left it at home. and But I had it. I had my first cell phone when I was 18. That was my message. <laughs> Today, the kids, they grew up. They grew up with it. And um, for them, it's quite normal um, that they always have the latest cell phone and that there is an innovation in this area every year or, or sometimes every few months. The problem is that many have lost the ability to for a real interaction with each other like i said that's not a rant about the, about the young the youngsters it's not their fault of course they are getting drawn and sucked into it um by someone who does it on purpose that's my opinion my my very own opinion i don't um, disagree with you at all I, I can observe it in my, myself in, in my environment. Of course, the kids still meet in real life, but the conversations, they are different. 
and no no longer as intense as it was when I was young. This is what I observe. Uh, the, I've noticed that it, these conversations, maybe at the, the, at the train station, at the bus stop, something like that, or, or even here at home with my, with my stepson when his uh, buddies are here, I've noticed that these conversations are very superficial. Let's call it superficial sometimes. They, they're, not, they're talking about deep shit and they don't go deep. And like you and I do, we're talking about great things. And even if it's just a UFO talk, nuts and bolts talk, I never heard these guys t talking about nice book or, or, or hey, have you seen this? They're talking about, hey, my fucking Nike Airs and uh, look at my, my, I bought this new cell phone and look at my, why, you know? But like I said, it's not their fault. You always have to point it out. Um, Yeah, because many simply no longer have, they don't have any deep thoughts because they are distracted by all the virtual temptations around them they, they they get drawn in uh, sucked into it and so i think it's difficult that the great thinkers and people with the courage to think crazy that the world needs will grow out of such a generation i think this is my message um the the never ending uh, never never ending never uh, the ever advancing technology challenges uh, the developers but that um, but takes away the consumers own thinking so, uh, and turns them into yeah into empty shells that simply consume and lose their focus uh, for their environment and the important things to a large extent so yeah in the end it was it was a rent sorry guys but this is my opinion on what what was happening around us these days i think it's crazy i think it's fucking crazy i don't i'm not bashing young people like i said not their fault we we observe it from a completely different perspective because we grew up completely different when i was at the bus stop Back then, before I went to school, maybe fifth, sixth, seventh grade, we had interesting talks. I remember interesting talks about stuff that is going on. Man, man, I remember sitting uh, when I was twelve or so with my best friend and neighbor sitting in a in a in a in a uh, in, in a box in his garden playing a spaceship, talking about <laughs> philosophing about what the world would look like in it was 1992 uh, we, we were discussing how the world would like would look like in the year 2000 <laughs> we imagined flying cars and supercomputers stuff like that these were our talks man yeah sorry please <laughs> say something don't be i i love a good get off my lawn uh this place was orange <laughs> groves as far as the eye could see you know kind of rant uh i, I love that man um it, it's a beautiful sentiment as well because i'm only you, you've only had two more summers than i have so i'm right behind you here as far as like my disdain for what's going on here but you and i were born in this dope ass middle window between generations or almost as like this pocket uh, that we exist in to where we did have the fresh air and outside and we remember our son being a little bit different. And then also we have uh, a foot in the technology, you know, a little bit later on in life to where we did have childhoods, which was great. We were outside like you, Ninja in the Forest, absolutely. Our uh, nephews, I think six and four, somewhere around in there, they came over for Thanksgiving. Uh, it's my brother's adopted kids. And what's interesting about them being on iPads and shit all the time, I'm going to rant with you here, buddy, is is that it's zapped their imagination, which is, which is fascinating because you and I growing up, I think that when we watched cartoons, it inspired our insp in imagination. And then we went outside and like built forts and we like played He-Man and we did that shit. We took it out and did our own thing. But now it's interesting to see that they don't, I, I noticed it with our little ones like I was running around in our field with them and like we picked up sticks and I, we pretended they were swords and they had a real tough time with it. I'm like, guys, this is imagination. We're having fun. And then eventually it didn't take them long at all. There's a there's an automatic lane that there's a spirit in there that wants to play and wants to do that. But there's this odd facade that society has seemed to give kids and for them to wear that if it's not digital, it's not valuable. And it's just interesting um, also because it seems that they've been disempowered to lead their own imaginations forward. That if it's not handed to them in the form of here's how you consume content or here's what's entertaining, uh, here's a valuable use of your time. Because that's sometimes, and I don't have kids, so I, I don't have a dog in any fight when it comes to this. I don't believe in dog fighting at all, actually. So, um, you know, the people that hand their kids an iPad and stuff, well, that's how they're spending time. So if if... 
it, it is interesting, the point that you bring up, Daniel, and I don't think that it's a, it's a weird one to go on at all. I'm grateful for your rant, sir. Yeah. <laughs> but the yeah, kids did great you. after that. They were playing, they were doing all kinds of shit. Our nephew, actually one of the funniest fucking things ever. My wife and I still crack up about this. Our little nephew, this little dude Sullivan, and he'll hear this when he's older and probably love it. Uh, I convinced them that our tree over here um, spit out magic acorns, but only the ones that were golden. So there are some at different stages, right? And so if you could find a golden one, right? And I showed them the difference. I'm like, no, 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 all these are whatever, but this is a magic one. So then they're on the hunt. So we were out here playing in the backyard pretty far away from him. He goes and finds one of these things and runs it over to us, saying that he found the most special acorn ever. He's touting this from about 20 feet away. He's running, running, running. He gets right to our feet, dude, and drops the damn thing. It looks down like, like for, <laughs> like, I don't know. It felt like forever, but we were cracking up because he never found the most sacred acorn ever. And so I'm sitting here like... Try not to like make this kid feel bad, which he didn't. He just like stared at the damn ground like, oh my God, I just lost the most sacred acorn ever. But he was in it, you know, his imagination. I go, well, great. Now you planted it here and then it'll grow into the most beautiful tree ever, right? And that kind of whatever. But we were dying laughing at his excitement because his imagination was kicking. And that's not something that, I don't know, I've, it, based on what I've heard, that's just not something they do a lot of. So it was really cool. Yeah. Do you remember the times when you were outside playing, playing? Like I said, I I, I was I was a ninja all the time uh, with my with my best friend. But do you remember when you when you were really into it? Like really, you 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 you've been that fucking ninja, and, and like your surroundings even changed. It's like oh, yeah. reading a fucking good book these days. Now I wish I could read like I like I like I did read books twenty years ago. I was into Perry Roden. Do you know Perry Roden? No. It's a science fiction novel, started 1961, I think, uh, 60, 61, and it's going on to this day. And um, I, it's this little um, little magazines that you can buy for a dollar or so in, in, the, in the store. And it became so famous that they printed big books with a lot of stories in it. And it's an ongoing story. It's very, very famous around the globe. And... I fell in love with uh, Perry Roden. My father used to read it and I wasn't interested. But when I moved out, when I left my family and I picked up a book by accident, I think, and I fell in love with it and I read it and I remember getting really sucked into the story and I and I was the observer. I, I really, you don't, you, you haven't, you, you didn't see pictures of these guys in, in the books of, of the, of the, of these, all these guys and creatures. You didn't see anything. There was no pictures in it. Well, a few, but, um, um, it was only a little bit of artwork, but I've seen, I, I imagined how they look. I had my own imagination of how they look and, and how they're standing and, 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 and this and that. I was, it was, sometimes it was like, I was like, Imagine being sucked into the TV with a very good movie, and you're you're observing, you're you're standing behind the main character, and and sometimes you have to you have the feeling you have to step to the side a little bit just to don't catch a punch or so. That's how deep I was into these fucking stories, and this is how I played with my with my uh, with my neighbor and best friend back then. We were 10, 12, 13, something like that. We played like. Like Madman, we played Ninja and then Samurai and whatnot. And then my mother called from 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 the window and said, "Hey, come in." And we and you were like, "Where am I?" <laughs> yeah, you're, you're transported back to this fucking place. You're like, ah, yeah. oh, what the this hell? is how intense we 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 played, or at least I I played and how I, how I felt it. I was really angry at my mother to that she pulled me out of it because I was really I created my own world and I saw it. I. I I saw everything as if it, it it's crazy, and this is what I miss with with uh, the younger generation right now. I tried to uh, give a, a book to my stepson, an interesting book. It was a book. Uh, it was a uh, um, Eric von Daniken book, and uh, I tried to give it to him to to uh, get him into the topic. He said, "A book? No, I, I'm not reading a book." I said, "Try it. Read." Let me let me pick let me pick out a few a few interesting um pages for you and you just read the pages like two or three or four pages. No, I'm not reading a book. I'm not reading a book. I was very 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 disappointed. Same with my daughter. He said no, I'm not reading. I'm not reading. Not read. They have not one book in their room. That's very sad. But I, I can't force them to read. But a few days after that, came to me and said, Oh, look at this. I found a very interesting video. 
And I said, oh, a video. Yeah. A farting cat. And he said, no, <laughs> it's uh, fucking stars. Uh, he uh, And planets. Do you notice know videos there on YouTube? Guys uh, out there, you might know it. Um, there's these videos out there where they um, compare planet sizes. You see Earth and then you see the next bigger, next bigger, next bigger, next bigger. And, and in the end, you have a fucking big planet with Earth fits like a million times into this fucking planet. I don't know. And he's, he found it so interesting, that video. He was so blown away by how big of... Uh, how big planets can 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 get and i said this is science this is science and now pick a book and read a fucking book he said no but i will look out for videos like that in the future he said and then he found a video um with planet sounds guys maybe you guys you found you found it also on youtube you can if you type in planet sounds every planet has its very own sound and uh you can you can hear to the actual sounds that planets made uh, on YouTube. You can type in planet sounds, and he found it also very interesting, very spooky sounds sometimes. And yeah, he likes stuff like that. So technology, iPads and hand, and cell phones and computers are not always bad. I'm not ranting about uh, all that shit. It's it it can be a tool to to learn also and to to expand your mind and your expand your reality. Also. Come so, out, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Uh, yeah. But um, where I was going a few minutes ago, I don't remember. We're talking about the uh, the pyramids. And we're talking about the possibility that maybe aliens helped to create all the shit, like the pyramids and stuff like that. If you don't mind, let me get into that a little bit. Hell yeah. Um, I, I'm sure you and your listeners and viewers out there, uh, let, let us know in the comments, have heard about the Dogon people already who lived in, in West Africa. I find that very interesting, very interesting story. I never um, covered a topic in my podcast. I should do that. Um, one aspect of the culture is the knowledge of uh, Sirius B, uh, companion to, to, to the star Sirius A. And before telescopes were even invented, a Dogen reported the deta details about uh, the orbit and the color of Sirius B. They spoke of um, beings they called, oh, do you know it? Uh, uh, Namo? N O M M O Namo, I think it was these beings were called Namo. Um, they spoke about these beings, um, and these beings. They say these beings came from the stars. These beings allegedly um, imparted knowledge of astronomy and uh, agri agriculture to humans, as well as uh, engaged in discussions about spiritual matters. I think. Um, yeah, I have to look it up again, but. Um, the god of the universe, they call Emma, A M M A, sent the Dogon to to human to the humans on Earth, um, and the normal word described as half human, half amphibian. Sounds funny, but it's interesting. They have uh, they have uh, I think there's a rock paintings, rock carvings out there. We can look them up. Um, Namo N O M M O. I think yeah. Um, um, they were initially red. The, the color were red, but turning white when they when they step foot on Earth, they turned white. That's interesting. I don't know if there's an explanation for that, but I found that an interesting uh, point. Um, yeah, they supposedly originated from the Sirius uh, system, residing on a planet within that system, and that's interesting. Those, uh, as people like to call them, sometimes primitive people talked about that fucking crazy stuff, talked about um, beings coming from the stars, coming from Sirius uh, B and uh, teaching them shit about uh, agriculture and uh, as astronomy. So that's fucking, uh, fucking interesting. Dude, that shit is crazy. Uh, and, and then you ask, like, what is that all about? Because then do you consider the flat earth model or have you uh, looked into that at all? What do you think of that? We, Dustin and I, we invited a flat earther to our podcast, but not to bash him or, or, or critique him. I'm not into that. Everybody coming to our podcast, no matter how crazy the topic is, um, I love to listen to the stories. I like to listen to the stories. I like to provide a platform so everybody can form its own opinion. And often, very often, I invite people, also in the German podcast, 
to tell the stories about stuff that I'm really not into. Uh, and I sometimes I really do not like the topics, but I know there's people out there that like it. And one of that is the flat earth model. <laughs> I, I really, um, that's really, no, that's a no, no for me. I, I really do not believe that earth might be flat. I know that earth is not really a round ball. Of course, it's not a perfect round ball. We know that we all know that, but I don't think the earth is flat. And I don't, I don't feel uh, the, the conspiracy behind all that. I don't, even if it was flat, why keep it from us? Why tell us it's a fucking ball? Why not tell us it's flat? What's the, what, what's the mystery behind it? What's the use? What's the use in it? I don't fucking care if it's flat or, or, or a triangle shaped or, or I, I don't care. Maybe could be, could have eight edges. I don't, I don't care. I, I really don't, don't care. I don't feel, I just don't feel a conspiracy behind it. And I, um, I'm one of these people who do believe we have been to space because it's an argue, often an argument by these flat earth uh, guys that they say we haven't been to space and there is not, not really a picture of, of earth and of the, all these planets and that, that tells us they are, are, are uh, spheric. And maybe if I, if I was the same way and, and uh, would think that we haven't been to space, it would be easier for me to jump on the, the topic, but it isn't. I do believe we have been to space. Maybe we haven't been on the moon the time they told us they were on the, on the moon. I don't know, but we have been to moon. I'm, I'm sure. And I, I believe that there are pictures out there from actual planets and <laughs> they tell us they are, are, are uh, a ball. This is what I find so fascinating about the psychology of this place is that you can get to the point where you can believe that we left it and that there are things out there though with this story above the fact that we left it that are in question. But the fact that we left is the basis of no question whatsoever. I just find that part interesting. And I think that the if it is a PSYOP, which I'm not saying it is, <clears throat> but if it is, then it seems to be interesting that if again it's gotten a lot of people just off the ground it's gotten people in the air and in space and the idea that um even with sort of the extra apollo missions and the moon stuff it's it's still there's still conspiracy to be had if you subscribe to the fact that it exists so that conspiracy can exist there right and so again with the in my view where i'm at right now is everything here everything here even found down to its core foundational is an inversion of what's true. And it's, I feel, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, one of our greatest, uh, I guess, goals here or um, bits of opportunity of experience is to sort of discover that. And whenever I looked into the flat earth thing first, I was obsessed with it. It was like uh, three years ago and I was just like, what the fuck is this? And my beautiful wife at the time sat through three weeks of me just watching videos, asking questions, doing all this shit. Then I just sort of put it down for a little bit. And then I got um, back into the realm of spirituality and really started asking these interesting questions about this being a realm and a simulation. And in that way, it could simulate anything you want. It could be um, if you as the observer here choose for this to be a globe, then you could technically hop into a rocket if it's a thing and shoot off and because that reality would manifest ahead of you. Same to that. That if you were to say that this place is a uh, you know flat edge or whatever, and then you go to the edge and there's an edge, right? But let's say... That within that game, there's there also are presuppositions that just getting people the idea that space exists takes out a massive load off of the creators or the implementers of the facade of this place. I'll say that. The implementers of the facade, it's easier for them then to say, yeah, you're on this little ball. Uh, there's a bunch of shit out there. We're going to show you some images. They, they don't even call them photos, by the way. They call them images, which is not a photo. Um, so then what they'll say is that we're on this little ball. There's places out there. Now, the aliens, air quotes, are in cahoots with this idea as well. And I'm going to answer your question on why, or I'm going to answer one of the questions of why, which may, you know, I mean, may uh, lead to more questions, which is what it did for me. So the idea then that these aliens are in on it means that now the aliens are telling people, yeah, I'm from Zeta Reticuli, but this is, this is what made me bring it up, is the Dogon tribe, right? They would then know things about a place that later people would discover through observation. Now, rather, that was their 
before or not. They're simply observing it in that fact created it, right? One of these kind of fucking concepts. Uh, then maybe that's the case. Or uh, it's something that the aliens, whatever they are, are in on this massive conspiracy because the Earth is not round. Uh, or because rather it's like a plane that goes out. And really what extraterrestrial means is extra land. And to answer what I think the biggest conspiracy with that would be would be to take the confined lands in which we find ourselves and then to imaginatively wrap it around a ball and say that's all there is that's all you have access to rather on this area but if you were to then go with a lot of the ancient maps and if we're talking about a de-evolution in society that actually we're de-evolving to see this place more inaccurately than ever then one could say that really with the flat earth maps and all of the uh, things like that uh, Japan map that was released, it was found in the caves of Tibet with all the other countries around it, all those other continents, that to me blows my mind. And that would also be a wonderful psyop for the douchebags that seem to be scarcity driven here that really want you to think that there's a limited amount of things and it's real hard to obtain and that people have to suffer to, to just exist. But if you're on an expansive place with all of these resources, then that's not accurate, is it? So then you start toppling economies and things like that. So there's a, I think that there's a contrived um, invested interest in them, them, the them that would like for you to not know what this place and what you are at all. There's a heavy interest in that model. You're seeing it on like the universal before every movie, right? It's pumped into your psyche constantly, the globes in school, all of these things I feel again are strong apprehensions that are put in you very early on so is their unquestion they're ridiculous to question later is how i feel about it and so it's a brilliant scheme but what it is is the fundamental foundation of what this place is and then that to me changes everything which is why it's valuable i i love what you just said with the extraterrestrial so it means extra land haven't well because it my mind until until you know I'll pull something up here, and this is um, by a book I've got on the shelf back there that I'm not going to grab, but it's by Nos Confunda, and it's called, um, shit, hang on one second, um, Extraterrestrial Nos Confundum, man. yeah, N Nos Confundum is what it is, and what this dude uh, talks about is the idea that maybe this place is uh, completely different, like completely different, <clears throat> more to the regard that it is this flat an expansive place, but really more to where it's it's sort of a cell, if you want to say that. Um, it's interesting when you start looking at this stuff. I'm going to pull up a fuzzy picture of it for you. Uh, guys, uh, link in the show description for the video version of this so that you guys can check it out. And boom, pow, there it is. So if you could see that there on the screen, this is his idea. Uh, now, Earth is right here, by the way. So if you look at things this way, um, then we could say like this idea of the ice wall and all of that kind of stuff to where you do have these rings, but these additional land bits are what I find very interesting, right? Let's say that this is our world and this is what they're saying is Antarctica, which matches a lot of descriptions, okay? Um, then out just outside of this, by, by way, there's also little gates and things in here. Let me... Um, there's also little gates and stuff inside here that you can actually sail to the outside, allegedly, uh, to the other lands, right? And now when you look at this, Asgard, Amen, Mermaid Islands, maybe some of these things just sort of slip into our reality or maybe they have access all the time. Uh, maybe there's, like I said, a lot cooler things going on here than what we're being told. Yeah, that picture just sucks of that thing, but you find a better mm -hmm. picture of it. Yeah, no, I, I get the idea and I... I, I... I really do. I'm starting to like the idea. I haven't seen this picture. This picture makes uh, the whole topic uh, more interesting for me, to be honest. And I will have a look into it. So that means uh, this uh, map means that space is actually not real. If I in the sense, it. so but who's to say? You know, maybe something outside of this cell. Like maybe we're just in a cell. Because if you look at that, that looks like an amoeba or something like this, right? Um, and then who knows what's the, the unknown land. So you're talking about this millions of miles of distance to something that's unknown. But in between there, you cross a bunch of shit again, allegedly on this map. But from our place here, you could see that the Anunnaki lands are right here. Lands of Neptune, lands of Venus, lands of Draco, Saturn, Alderaan, uh, land of the angels, lands of Mars. So whenever a Martian comes to visit you, maybe they're just flying the fuck over here and visiting you, you know, but they all are in cahoots with the idea that this backwoods area of the map doesn't know that this is what the map is. You know, it's like they say, right? The map is not the territory. 
Yeah. And it's interesting when you start contemplating things like this to then take maybe the things that are planets in the sky are really luminaries. And I had a guy on recently, Tyler Hansen, that zooms into stars and they look wild. He finds dog faces in them and they look like they're underwater to a degree. So again, I find the, I find the thing interesting as all. It is interesting indeed. I will, I will look into that. That's very interesting. Yeah. And maybe those some um, extraterrestrials uh, or aliens uh, that visit us are our neighbors that maybe knows more than we do. And only we are the, the stupid ones who think <laughs> we're a ball floating in space. I do believe that, by the way, but it doesn't matter. I, I will uh, have a look into that uh, theory. I, I really do like it, man. I, I haven't seen the picture before. I really do like it. Um, yeah. It dovetails so nice with the modus operandi of this place, which is perception management in my mind. Its job is to fool the fuck out of you. And so if you have certain things that are so certain here, I think those are the things that you should be questioning the most. Yeah. I think, I think about um, if these extraterrestrials are actually our neighbors, if you're meant to meet each other. So there must be a meaning behind it. If Maybe you're a pet. Is to them you know did you ever adopt a um a animal like when i was in third grade we adopted a whale um a humpback whale and we all paid like seven bucks and we're told that we adopted this whale and we had a picture of its tail and that's how you knew it was your whale uh did you ever do anything like that in kids like sponsor a panda bear or something like yeah, that yeah. Course, so what if yeah. it's something like that because if you look at the consistency of reports because you've talked to a lot of contactees it's usually not pleiadians hanging out one night grays hanging out the next uh anunnaki another night it's usually one set of beings air quotes and it's usually uh the ones now they may change from like a teddy bear as they're a kid to a gray uh to a pleiadian and then they say that that's a stair step meaning that they basically like bitched you out right to um they pimp you out to another species, which is interesting, but this could be sort of a cell project as well. I think they covered this in uh, Jupiter is Jupiter ascending. Did you ever watch that movie? Yes. Yeah. So something like that where it's really just energy and you're just sort of stock and property. And maybe you can be sold to one of these other um, vendors, these interests. It's interesting. Very interesting thoughts, man. That's why I love you. <laughs> I love you. And, um, They're mostly gross, actually. I'm not a fan of this theory, but it makes more sense than the one proposed, honestly. Yeah. But uh, what does this theory uh, say about um, how old are these different civilizations then? I mean, if everything is on one uh, piece of dirt, so is it possible that some civilizations are millions of years ahead or behind? It seems like this in my mind is a garden for these very advanced beings that need this energy, our energy for something. Maybe this is a cabbage patch uh, garden for a food forest for something, right? And every now and then they come through and flood it, which is what we talked about, about ancient societies kind of being too smart. They're like, no, 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 they're figuring out some dope shit and how to build some stuff. They're kind of getting close to figuring out what this place really is, or maybe they knew what this place really was and that was too much for them to bear for what they really were. Maybe they came to terms with what they really were, which seems to be harder for our society if it's what's occurring, if we are a food source. So if we are a food source, um, then every now and then they plow the field, right? You need to get a new crop in there and you need things to change up and you do that by tilling the land, you do a big reset, but just like you know, in your garden, maybe there's a little garden gnome out there called the pyramid that you kind of like the look of, so you just leave it every time and you just kind of move around, mow around it a little bit and then it's in your next garden as well for your new crops. And then that's what we are, which could be what this contact phenomena is altogether. I think the fact that we can be so mentally switched off at any moment by these things, whatever it is, is a built-in mechanism of that we are some sort of either AI or some sort of crop, some sort of, and there's some resonance built into our DNA that we just shut down whenever we see them because we've been apprehended in some way. Um, almost like a mental tranquilizer dart that just goes, yep, you're our food, you're, you, we have control over you kind of thing. They just shut you down. It's weird, man. I don't know. I don't trust it. Whatever it is. Yeah. Man, you just expanded my reality. <laughs> It'll happen, dude. And this is the thing. And this is why, like, just going, no, I can't. I, I, I will say that the Earth is at least round. Now that, now that we've even considered the possibility that that in itself is a PSYOP, then that leads you to more questions, right? I mean, it's just interesting when you consider it. I have no fucking clue what's going on here. But 
as somebody who pays attention to systems and how they function, this one functions pretty goddamn well. And when you plug in the dark matter equation, dark matter being that we are the matter that is the fuel for the system in a crop in certain ways, it's, it's pretty dark, man. I mean, it's weird. It works, but it's dark from our perspective. But maybe again, from this um, lands of Draco, yeah. they're having a blast and they love a, we're a delicacy. In my, it's just in my naive worldview, sometimes I simply refuse to see a uh, conspiracy behind everything. I, I deal with people in the podcast and around me that see a conspiracy in everything, everything. Uh, I mean, pharma industry, of course, there's a lot of fuckery going on. I don't doubt <laughs> the pharma industry is fucking around with us. Um, of course, politics, um, money, banks, I mean, everything, there's foul apples, right? I know that. I know that. But I just simply refuse to, to fill myself up with anger about everything being a conspiracy. NASA is fucked up and uh, politicians are fucked up. Pharma industry is fucked up. Uh, food is fucked up. Everything is fucked. I just simply refuse to, to jump on every theory. I know there's something behind everything, of course, but I refuse to make my life uh, worse with the the thought of it every day and all day long. I people that got that that got, they got lost in all that shit. They go outside, they see conspiracy everywhere. They oh, this guy he's observing me, and this and that is observing me, and my cell phone is observing me, and everything is observing me. Of course, my cell phone is observing me. I know that it's probably listening right now. Fuck it. I bought it. I know it. I I just don't. What if? Fuck it. It's if I if I don't want to, I, I turn it off or put it away or something like that. But there's some things that I do like, and the one that that you presented right now, <laughs> I really do love the idea. Um, I, like I said, I will have a look into that. In my in my in my naive opinion or 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 approach when it comes to alien life is that earth is a relatively young planet and somewhere out there there are civilizations that are thousands of millions and year of years ahead of us um when considering this human what humans have invented and developed in in their short exist time, uh, existence span of existence uh, one can only imagine what life might be like on the planet of a much more advanced species, especially um, where do such beings stand intellectually? That's interesting. That's an interesting thought. What, uh, uh, what pre preoccupies them? What is the purpose of their existence? That's, that's these thoughts I deal with. Are such beings interested uh, in, in, in making contact with us vastly underdeveloped life forms like us is there a purpose and a meaning to it mm, personally i do I, I do not think so i don't think so i believe they observe and study um there might be species that are not too far from our stage of de development i believe that and perhaps they are more interested in making contact with that uh, making contact with us i believe that too but um considering the the uh Typical earthly problems we still have: war, greed, envy, hunger. Um, you have to wonder what the benefit could be for such beings to engage with us, right? So these are my naive thoughts when it comes to alien life. These are the problems I'm dealing with in my, inside my head. What could be the motivation for them to con connect with species dealing with these issues? I, I think I told you that I'm into H.P. Lovecraft a, lo a lot, and I I loved his dark shit I'm, I'm, are you into lovecraft a little bit a uh, little bit absolutely yeah the yeah, cthulhu I, I, is badass man what I a love cool character creature you know i don't love that he's it was fucking racist but it doesn't matter um you still can love the <laughs> the novels and, and the shit i love it man lovecraft i, I love i i love how lovecraft uses and describes the great old ones could be aliens too, right? These um, indescribable beings um, about whom we have no idea what their agenda is. That's crazy. It's a crazy thought. These are thoughts that I have. Um, but we know that to them, we humans are utterly insignificant, at least in Lovecraft's uh, novels. 
But then we are dirt, we are atoms, we are we're, we're nothing, we're just slaves to them, and that and that terrifies us, right? To be confronted with a creature that emerges from the from the from the I don't know from the from the fucking void and is completely indifferent to us. We don't know what it intends. We don't know how it will treat us when it arrives, and it triggers fears of the fears of the unknown within us. These are my thoughts. Well, and we're um, brought up to hate everything that's different than us anyway, even in our own species. You know, racism's learned. That's a learned thing that kids are taught, you know, based yeah. on their environment. So it, it's not innate in us to be that way. It's it's something fucked up. And I think it's parasitic, if anything. If you find, like, your Hitler's running around out there, that's a, that's a parasitic entity, probably in control of some new world order that's been in control of this place the entire time. That sort of just steps up technology as a distraction, not as an aid to humanity as in which it's presented. Like, so I don't know how much better off you think society is, but I, I don't think it's much better, you know, than the 80s when we were growing up without all this shit going on. I'd say we're more connected, but you know, at what cost? You know, it's very interesting that it's sort of like, it feels like if it is a game and that you and I chose this, that we really knew shit would need to hit the fan for us to come together to defeat it. It's almost like this... Um, counterintuitive strategy to the game if anything else it's uh like when you run further away from something it gets further away from you but to beat the game you have to come in contact with it yes. so it's almost like one of those magnetism electromagnetism things i don't know it's fa it's fascinating though and it it just seems that the interaction between people uh even though we're more connected now yes it's separating out those who really aren't here for connection but those who are like you and i i mean we're setting up plans to meet each other in person we've got events going on now so we're taking it out of the digital and into the let's get amongst them, you know, in the reality. And I think that that's something that a lot of us are choosing to do now, but that not a lot of people will. Like you said, there, um, there's a reclusion that's also incentivized in this kind of connectivity because not all of it is real. So you get the idea that everyone on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or something is a real person, but I'm going to say absolutely fucking not. And there's obvious ones, especially like you, you get a lot of messages and shit. Like I do, you get a lot of comments. You can tell based on the profile if it's a real one or not, just based on the direction that they lean the conversation in the comments, as well as how many followers. You can see how old their profile is. All these kind of interesting things. When you look at it, it's not real at all. It's a bot. And so then to like base your life on that and to say, oh my God, I need X amount of followers or I need X amount of comments or I'm grateful that I'm engaging in my comment section because uh, I'm going to lose people if I don't. Then it's, again, if you look at it like, maybe or maybe it's a bunch of fucking bots and you can tell the real people in most degrees but i'd say to live your life as slaves by this external reality is what this place is really 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 good at and if anything man um i think if there is a meaning to this place it's to be aware of one single thing it's that your energy is what creates your reality and what fuels and what grows in your existence so if you're looking at the problems of your life those are going to swell at infinitum how I sort of look at this is like everything around you is one of those carnival game balloons that when you shoot into the mouth of a clown, its head gets bigger, you know, and explodes, right? And it, everything around here wants you to fill it with your attention so that it can expand and grow with your energy. And if you look at the place like that, that single observation is one of the most terrifying but empowering because then you're not swayed by any of this dumb shit. You know that the mental parasites that have come in for a little bit are just that temporary and very uh, small and they need to come at you in these really odd distracting ways just to get a little bit of your energy this is what i think the media does this whole look over here all the shit going on all the ah it's dangling keys just looking for your attention literally this is why also they say go within go within you know i i am seeing this concept more and more and more and this isn't necessarily a don't interact with anything because I don't absolutely don't believe in that at all. There's a there's a fine middle balance here that I'm achieving graciously and, caut and cautiously optimistically uh, that is this integration of the dark, but being the br letting the dark be the fuel that fuels the brightest light I've ever fucking been. And it's one of the most insane transitions I've ever gone through. And it's it's incredibly powerful. But it is, again, the realization that everything out here, even us in this conversation, this is an energy exchange, you and I. And uh, the people listening, this is an energy exchange with them as well. And so to realize that everything in your reality, your thoughts, your everything is fueling whatever you're giving your attention to, that has been the single greatest awareness. I still feel it's a temporary truth. I think it's a stair step to another understanding that I'll achieve later. But 
I'm pretty happy with that one because it's changed my life. It really has. It's made me way more mindful of what I fill with my attention. Yeah. Very, very interesting thoughts, man. I love to reside in this vessel in at these times. Yeah. Because we live in very interesting times um, where people like you are observing and experiencing and uh, researching all these very, very interesting topics. And I don't know if we still have a few minutes, we can uh, we can get into um, the, the, the topic that I wanted to talk about maybe an hour ago or so. Um, because Please. people back then, uh, maybe in the medi medieval times, they also loved to maybe they, they did not love to, but they had to deal with stuff like that too. And uh, had uh, did break their head about certain stuff and um i like to talk about folklore legends especially superstitions and um we're going away from the aliens now man and going to a different uh, topic a little bit at least um i had this podcast conversation uh, here in germany with uh, the cur curator of a superstition museum um and he shared a lot of fascinating stories with me. His name is Gunther Altenkirch. Uh, uh, probably be a little bit hard for you to, to say his name, but he's a very interesting guy. He's an elderly man, um, but he has this awesome superstition museum where he collects all these crazy things. And um, yeah, let me get into it a little bit. Um, among them, um, he shared many stories with me and among them there were tales related to superstitions surrounding houses and i love superstitions around the house because we also live in a very old house my wonderful wife and i uh, with the kids we have a very old house from 1860 like i said something like that i don't remember exactly but it's very old and we discussed the subject of building sacrifices uh, in german it's bauopfer i don't know how to I don't know if there's a, a term in English that describes it, uh, but building sacrifices. So when constructing a house, they would take, um, it's, a, it's a little bit macabre, but they took a live cat, sometimes a live dog, and placing them in a bricked enclosure in the basement while still alive. So basically bury him alive. And um, I'm a construction worker. And I once worked in an old house in my hometown here. The owner told me that she found an old cat in the basement nailed to a wooden bench um, about head height, I would say. Uh, desiccated cat. Is it called desiccated? It was dry. You know what I mean? It was completely dry already. The man from the museum told me, because I told him what, what I experienced, and he told me that the new owners of the house, maybe the old the guys they originally built the house, they died, and then to, uh, 50 years later, someone else bought the house or moved in. Um, they sometimes took these dead cats out of their stone graves and they nailed them somewhere else to ensure the continued protection of the house. So they nailed him to their doors or, or in, the, in, the, in the woodshed, something like that to yeah, ensure the protection. As gruesome as it sounds, people back then strongly believed that uh, this ritual would bless and protect the house. Like I said, for example, it was thought to guard against fire, storms, other kind of damages. And um, he recounted a story for which he even had an, um, a written record. And that's interesting. The original written record of this incident, which I'm about to tell you, and this is People fasten seatbelts because <clears throat> this made me um, almost tear up when I heard it the first time. It tells the story of a poor woman who sold her daughter for a few coins to wealthy individuals who used the child as a sacrifice during construction. I told you about the cats, about the dogs, but this woman was poor and it was a, a big house. Wealthy people built it, like I said, and they wanted to, yeah give the spirits a very good sacrifice. Um, and similar to the fate of the cats and dogs, the child was walled in alive. And the mother was given um, uh, 
honorary seat in the front row while that happened. And like I said, people keep in mind, this is a, a, a written record. It's, um, it's oh, with the original letters, everything, um, date, stamp on it, everything, it's um, documented. So this really happened. In the record, it described um, how the child repeatedly called out her mother while being walled in. Um, you could hear her saying, mother, mother, I can see you, I can see you. And then as the wall was built higher, she cried, mother, I'm standing on tiptoes and I still can see you. Man, that's, it's gut-wrenching, right? I, I almost cried when I heard it. And, and um, finally, as the last stone was um, placed, the girl, she was full of fear. And she cried out, mother, it's dark and I'm very afraid. And she cried and, and man, yeah, makes you, it's a hard pounding. Sorry, man. And people in the past used to place various items under the floorboards. We found uh, them here in, in our house. We found them, um, found them um, pictures, um, drawings, buttons, small dolls, or maybe arms and legs of, of small dolls. Um, we found chicken wings and people sometimes find eggs, stuff like that. Not only or shoes, ha a hat, an old hat. Just those were all these construction sacrifices. I don't know, like I said, if there's an English term for it, but let's call it construction sacrifice. Yeah. Um, if you want to say something <laughs> um, to what I said, um, go for it. That's easily the grossest story we've ever heard here. And we've heard a lot um, in a lot of episodes and that was horrific. But what I will say also is that it's interesting that they thought that this was for luck. I see it as the complete opposite. I see it as you beginning this building's history on a traumatic event, doing something fucked up with the intent of doing something fucked up, whether misguided or not, you know that that's fucked up. And then carrying it out anyway, which then in my mind solidifies the fact that that building will be a conduit for something for a long time. So the fact that it was woven into construction lore to, oh, make sure that you do something fucked up to your building before so that, you know, any spirit we want can access it. Maybe those are the puppeted by the entities who access it, right? It's, um, it, it's fucked it, Daniel. Um, that, that whole concept, man, it, it's disgusting and uh, it seems um, just pretty uh, sick to be honest with you uh, just in every degree it is it is sick it's gut wrenching man like I said when I heard the story um, while he told me the story I almost teared up a little bit I have kids myself man I can imagine doing that to my kid I, I would I would I would rather starve to death than selling my kid for such a purpose but people back then had a strong they, every, all they had were, were, were they believe in God and religion right yeah, but so what of what degree of what God were you believing and what religion did you believe? You know, cause you can be convinced. And if, as long as enough people are convinced that this ritual is a good one, then they'll do it. I mean, that's fucked up against all morality. And, and you find you are, you're a preacher or something. I don't know, or, or a man or a woman who can convince somebody like really easy. And you find someone like this desperate woman who are on the streets, no, no roof above your head. And, um, yeah, we got a new bank seen, going in. We really need a sacrifice for this. I don't want to wall my own kid into this fucking thing. Yeah, people. Good thing we've kept much. everyone in poverty so that we can exploit the energy resources of our harvest. It's almost like these bankers and shit keep you, attempt to keep people in that state also. You know, it's a, it's its own type of harvest. And this is what signing your kid over with their birth certificate does as well. CPS, you, you don't, your kid's not your kid. The state owns your kid if you have a birth certificate. And so yeah. they can come up, deem you an unfit parent for any reason they make up. And then now they have your kid for whatever. They could wall it up yeah. in a fucking building. I mean, this is, it's a dark ass place. And this is why also I'm not a huge fan of that idea of like, oh, this is fucking, we're going to 5D guys. I'm, mm, I, I don't know, man. It, it's shit like that. Like kids getting walled up in fucking rooms and horrific things like that, that I don't know, maybe sort of doubt the um, optimism people have for the, for the place in which we find ourselves, dude. But as fucked up as the story is, it's uh, important to to say that this was not the norm. It's it there was didn't have happen very often that they took humans. They took humans, and he also told me stories about how um, um, inmates or thieves and, and people like that was chosen. They they was given the the uh, opportunity to be walled in instead of dying somewhere in a cage from hunger. 
starved to death or or being uh, beheaded or something like that. They said, hey, man, you can you can die for a good purpose. Let's uh, fucking wall you in or we chop your head off or we, uh, I don't know, go to the gallow or, or poison you or whatever they did to the people back then. You know it. Um, they, they broke your bones in, in a million places. So they, yeah, some of them said, yeah, fucking wall me in. I don't care. So, yeah. And this is why I sometimes I often say, I don't know about good and bad, about the concept of good and bad. What is good and bad? Who decides what is good and bad? We invented good and fucking bad. We humans invented. This is our concept, the human concept, good and bad. But what is good and bad? People thought back then it was good to wall in, uh, uh, I don't know, a 10 or 11 or 12 year old uh, girl because uh, to 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 satisfy the spirits of the, of the fucking house and uh, in other um, occurrences people were walled in you know that in history people were walled in as a punishment of course they were walled in alive uh, as a punishment because they did something fucked up so they, they took thieves or, or assassins or, or I don't know even monks or some guys that betrayed the, the, the king or the emperor, they walled them in and killed them with it. So what's good and bad? Good and bad is a strange concept, man. What is good? What is bad? We decide, uh, those who have the power decide what is good and bad. Now we're in, in, a, in a point of time again where, um, yeah, a lot of things are bad. <laughs> so it's it's crazy to wrap your mind around that. It is. I, I think, though, the times are shifting uh, quite a bit. I think with our energy being focused on the more that we're creating here rather than what is being attempted to be taken from us uh, that hasn't been taken yet. Um, I think that that is where the true power lies, is even hearing a story like that and going, man, that was fucked. I'm glad we don't live like that. And I definitely don't um, think that that's a cool way to exist. Like, you know, just little considerations as far as not finding that a viable option for experience uh, to further our progress anymore, man. It's just a, it's a wild, wild realm, dude. And, um, I don't know. I, I think about, uh, again, the perception management, man, the idea that somebody, and not even somebody, an entire generation or several generations of people were convinced that that was the way to go and that that was just like uh, the options that they had available to them. Um, it's just interesting as all. Well. I don't know. I think it's it is. And another example is we talk about witches, especially here in Germany or in Europe. Uh, indeed, people in the past harbored intense fears uh, of witches, especially especially in Germany and Europe. And we had witch burnings in, in this fucking village where I live too. I have a book. I, I, I purchased a book not too long ago um, with, with stories and, and cases about witch trials here in my area, like in, in, a, in, a, in a radius of 100 kilometers or so. And I found out that in, in my village here, they had six or, I, I don't know, six or seven witches with the, which they... Um, Put on the pyre and, and burned so um uh, yeah it's people were afraid of witches back then of course as the as a protective measure against them individuals would nail various things to the front door i t uh, told you uh, feathers tools wire stuff like that because they use it as protection against witchcraft and witches. Occasionally, a pitchfork um, would be leaned against the wall or a broom, but they would put it on the wall upside down because they thought the witch wouldn't land. Um, um, it's, it's, the crazy thing about it is, so we have people here who tried to, and they use magic spells too, to get rid of witches. They use magic spells and, sh and shit like that. So th we have people here who try to protect themselves from precisely the same thing, <laughs> using magic spells. And this is quite bizarre. They're using magic spells and, and, and uh, magic objects they put on the door and, and on the st under the stove and stuff like that because they were afraid of witchcraft. That's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. They killed the same people and they did the same. They killed these people who did stuff like that, who dealt with that stuff. Mostly it was women who knew how to brew a nice tea from, from herbs that they collected and they knew how to how to cure your belly aches and, and uh, your headaches and stuff like that. 
So yeah, we are of course we have to kill them. Why not? So and you did this fucking same thing to protect yourself from these people. Ain't that crazy? It is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's talk about the fucking devil. If when I and I told it in the, in the podcast I did before with the other guys. Um if you think about the devil, most of you out there think about the devil. How do you picture the devil when you think about the devil? Before I learned what I what I'm about to say, I picture the devil, of course, like it's it's a fucking bodybuilder, right? With animal legs and hooves and fucking horns and he's red. And yeah, he's this action figure and he's big. He's uh, as big, uh, at least as big as a man or, or twice the size of a man. And he has this fucking fork in his hands. And of course, he's sitting in hell waiting for your ass to come down there because you did a lot of fucking shit in your life, right? This is how people picture the devil. This is how pe people that fear the devil picture the devil. Of course, it must be, must be a very uh, intriguing figure, of course. But like I said, let's talk about the, de the devil. Um, people in the past, before religion hit really hard, they didn't didn't see the devil that way. They imagined the devil as a as a tiny as as tiny. It, it wasn't that devil. It was devils. They imagined the devils as tiny, cunning beings that wreaked havoc inside the house. <laughs> this is how people imagined those were little tiny like fucking, fairies. Like fairies, they mischievous creatures carried out malicious deeds with great cunning, all while avoiding uh, being seen because they were cowardly. The devil back then, the devils were, were cowards, and they did not want to get caught while tripping over your uh, glass of wine or glass of water. Later on, the church, as the church gained more influence, more and more influence, of course, we know that the devil transformed from those tiny cunning beings into this large menacing bodybuilder with a fucking pick for, pitchfork in his hand waiting for you on its throne in fucking hell. And people back then, they had their nature religions. They 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 love the nature spirits, love to, I don't know, dance around naked uh, around their favorite tree, watching a waterfall. And then church came and, say, and said, man, look what we have here. We have a nice book here. It's even better than what you believe. Oh, and by the way, if you don't follow the book, we'll fucking kill you. And there's reports of emperors that killed hundreds and thousands of people in just one day because they wouldn't accept the Christian religion. And this is fucked up, man. Nature religion was, was a good thing. Why not? But church came and said, "No, no, no! This is better. Look, look, look at this. It's it's way better." I I, I I'm sorry about me ranting here and and um, uh, taking up all the space here. But I, well, when I said uh, nature religions, I always have to think about this uh, story about the. Uh, maybe you heard it because it's very interesting. I will I will look it up. I will look the story up, and send it to you if you don't know it. There was this uh, female researcher who researched on um, chimps. And she told the story, I think it's many years ago, and she told the story about these chimps in that special area. Um, they traveled to a big waterfall. And the closer they got to this waterfall, they got more and more excited when they heard the waterfall. Oh, finally, I can hear the waterfall. And they got excited and excited. And they, and they went to the waterfall a few times a month, I don't know. And um, yeah. They got more and more excited while, while going there, listening to the waterfall. And when they arrived at the waterfall, they just stood there, watched the waterfall, and they started to sway left and right. Man, when I, when I, when I did read that, I almost cried, man. These fucking chimps standing there upright, and they swayed. They swayed to the sound of the waterfall. Imagine that. Isn't that crazy? That's and beautiful. they started yeah. to climb the waterfall, observing the water. They throw in sticks and and rocks and stones um, into the into the water, and 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 they watch for a long time how the stick would move in the water and go with the flow, and and how the rocks turn over and over. And they they really it really seemed to be. Um, but because when they when they when they were finished with uh, throwing rocks and shit. It's like it was like a ritual. She said it was like a ritual. When they finished with throwing rocks and all that stuff, they sat beside the waterfall and they just observed it, sucked up the energy and, and the, the, the area. And, and they were sitting here with open eyes, but they 
weren't really there. It was as if they were meditating. They were in a meditative state. That's so awesome. I, I, I love this article. I love to read this article. And imagine these chimps standing in front of the waterfall and swaying back and forth. Isn't that crazy, man? Isn't that crazy? Isn't it? How, how, and people back then also were connected with nature just like these chimps still are. And somebody came and took it from us. And they said, nature is the devil now. They made nature the devil. I have a guy a, a guy in Germany, his name is Thomas Höfgen, and he writes a book about it. And uh, and in, in one of his books, he talks about it, how, how religion um, uh, hit and made nature the devil. This is the term he uses. They made nature the devil. The devil is nature. These nature spirits are the devil. It's not a fucking red bodybuilder. Uh, it's nature. They made nature the devil. And this is crazy. This is really crazy. So sorry for my long rant, but um, yeah. No apologies <laughs> for the rant. It was a brilliant observation because now I'm sitting here thinking about, <clears throat> excuse me, this idea of like these archons or whatever, these small little things is what I've reduced them to. Before they were these huge, scary beings, but now they're these tiny little fucking get, get out of here. You know, these little things that just kind of tinker. It's not even... Um, it's just a little malicious and it's annoying uh, rather than anything else, but you don't give it your annoyance anymore, right? It's this interesting thing, but yes, the church would then make this idea of the devil be this huge thing. And we've talked about the idea of Lucifer or Satan and, you know, how many times is mentioned in the Bible versus what it really meant that, you know, Lucifer, the light bringer, right, is really more of an adversary to Jesus than than the uh, enemy, which is how it's portrayed in this scary way. Adversaries challenge you in certain ways and allow you to grow from dark places and all of this kind of stuff, but enemies and these things to be feared only recluse and make you withdraw and hide your light rather than shine it for fear of it being recognized by these dark beings and you not being strong enough because you've been told that you're not. And that is the biggest horse shit right there. It's, it, that is the inversion again, is that you are the powerful motherfucker and we're needing to be apprehended and so belittled and small and shrunken to be here as some sort of fucking beautiful food source because we are so goddamn powerful is sort of where I'm at with it now. It's uh, an interesting thing to see that though this is a mental battlefield, that if it is a battlefield at all, it's all about your mind. And so again, this what your attention goes to, if as you're cho making choices throughout your day, you think that some huge hoven kloofed uh, fucking bodybuilder with a pitchfork is going to jam it in your ass, then you make decisions differently. And so it's a good way to control a populace. It's this, you know, elf on a shelf or God or anything else. It's this idea that something's watching you um, and policing you with your own mind is how it works. Maybe the devil manifested into being this fucking red bodybuilder with a pitchfork uh, because a lot of people. Like an um, egregore, like put their energy to it and made it put so. Put their energy yeah. into it. Um, I was talking about, we were talking about uh, the concept of, I don't like church, right? Nobody likes church. Uh, I, if you believe in God, and even if the biblical God, you can you can um, praise him all day long while sitting at home. You don't have to go to church and put your money into this fucking bag. Keep your money, guys. Blasphemy. Yeah. It's like blasphemy. Yeah. Get him. Get his ass. But <laughs> yeah, you can. No, it's not uh, belief. It's not bound to the church. And I don't like the concept of church. Uh, of course, not every church is bad. Of course not. Of course not. And sometimes they do very, uh, very nice things and, and good good things. You have to point it out. But it all in all, the concept of church, I do. I I personally do not like the concept of church. I I don't. But um, we've talked about, uh, and I have been to church, man. I, I married two times, <laughs> and I and I. I don't know. Yeah. I was in church two times. <laughs> no, I was there more often. But I, what I liked about the church is um, the energy it creates. If you, I don't pray, um, or sometimes I pray, but I pray different. Uh, but it's my personal thing. I, I'm not talking about it, but I pray, but pray to some different being and then pray and pray different. And I pray, pray inside and I don't hold yeah, my hands, you. all of my yeah. knees. Yeah. Uh, I pray to the universe, maybe. Um, but in being inside a church sometimes um, gave me something. Uh, fuck, fuck what it is. I don't care. But the, the, the place and the building and see the building as, a, as some kind of antenna. It's all building is always with a, with a large tower and, and see it as an antenna and you are everybody 
all the, these batteries walk inside, right? <laughs> all these energizers walk inside, old ones, young ones, uh, teenagers, everything walks inside. And they all brain at the same time saying the same fucking things and creating an energy and maybe this energy, I mean, uh, take the term antenna as, as a metaphor, don't see it as a real antenna, but um, energy is created, energy is bundled, and energy is sent sent somewhere. I, even if I don't like the concept of church, like I said, it's a place where energy is created, energy gets bundled and sent out to who knows where. This is what I like about church. I don't like, I don't care what these songs and prayers are about, but I like the 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 drive when people when every when everybody's saying the same and and it, it's it's awesome and it's and it's it's awesome it's it's about frequencies we talk about frequencies when we talked it's also frequencies and yeah they get sent out somewhere to someone maybe or maybe they just um disappear somewhere but <laughs> yeah you know what i mean yeah it's fascinating and we do look at them as they were generating for energy and generating energy themselves with the cymatic patterns and the windows and these organs and all these amazing things. But again, we feel that that was probably from a time when it was being utilized, you know, for an altruistic purpose, if it ever was, you know, uh, maybe that in itself is a psyop. The thought that at one point it was there, but it's gone now is sort of in my mind also the idea that space is real, meaning that it's this thing out there, but you can't reach it because of our current understanding of technology, meaning that, yeah, this, this whole thing was here, but maybe it's just a... You know, maybe you woke up this morning with all of these memories implanted and none of it's real at all. And just this concept oh, yeah. of that what we've been researching and things are where we pick up the game at, you know, with this idea that it's real at all. And and we say this about history, man. It's it's a crapshoot, to be honest, I think. <laughs> Since I mentioned uh, the term of manifesting things, like I said, maybe people manifested the devil and it became really became the devil and hell exists i don't know i don't i don't think so i don't believe in heaven and hell you can create your own hell here on earth while you're alive <laughs> or you can create your own, your own heaven while you're alive yeah no to that point though what if there's enough people that believe that the devil is that that it again sort of like that comic uh that carnival game i was describing fills the balloon up to where now this thing is a real powerful entity and it's constantly being not only inflated but has influence because people are putting energy in toward that concept I think the second but, that you turn your energy off from any of those things, they instantly go away. But I do think that it's only real, re, becomes only a re reality for people who for the ones that believe blowing it. into the balloon. Yes, <laughs> so, exactly. You've nailed it. Yeah. That only applies to those that subscribe. Exactly. Well, then now scale that. That is scalable to anything in this reality, right? The wars, the government, any of your the shit that you think is out there to come and get you. Only if you're giving it the attention that it requires to come and get you. Yeah. What do you think about, and it's not as off topic as people might think now, what do you think about dragons? I think that what people are saying is dinosaurs was actually a shitload of dragons everywhere. And one thing that I do find also interesting is that the Chinese Zodiac has all real, air quotes, real characters on it except one, the dragon. Um, which is, you know, one could then say that maybe dragons were real and that none of them are fictitious at all. Um, I think that there's so many interesting things that they found in rocks. There's a buddy of mine, um, Tom Wheeler, a uh, shout out dude uh, from um, Sibs of Insta. The mountains were melted giants on, Insta on TikTok as well. And this dude has found some fascinating things where these mountains look like giant dragons or anything else. And I've heard a lot of controversy over dinosaurs, period. That the way that they were invented, that the dude that um, wrote them up, that actually all bones in any museum are not real, they say because it's radioactive from 65 million years ago, and that's why they don't display them. So they're all chicken bones that they've been sort of mashed and conglomerated together and then whittled into make what you see as presented as a dinosaur for you. Then there was this, you know, boggle in paleontology, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, where this guy came out and admitted that they took the list of dinosaurs that they had and had to shrink it by like at least two thirds because they were noting that uh, different ages in the same species as other species. So they would see a teenage T-Rex and call it a Velociraptor or something like that. But really it was just the same thing, just at a different stage of, of development, right? So there were those kind of interesting things. But again, the whole foundational idea that this place is that old, that an asteroid came and hit it, that there was a species of something that was not us here before, 
But when we look at carvings, there's all sorts of art with humans riding around on Baranosauruses and living side by side with Triceratopses and shit. So maybe they were a real thing, but I don't. But to your question specifically, dragons, I think, were a thing and that did exist and may still exist in some parts of this place. What if enough people were around that for some reason manifested, believed in beings like that, manifested them, when all these people uh, died out that believed in uh, these things, they died out too. Yeah. Um, we Here in Germany, we, we, all, we have a lot of stories about tales, and stories about dragons. Not not real reports about uh, eyewitness reports about dragons, but we have these old, very old tales, right? We have um, sometimes, and it's it's important to point out where the 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 dragon originally probably um, originated. the The dragon became a face many years, many 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 years after. The term dragon um, originated. Really? Like the ballpoint Sometimes, point pen that Anne Frank wrote her diary in wasn't invented until five years later? Maybe. <laughs> Sometimes a dragon was simply the smoke coming from a chimney. Talking about the uh, these times that I told you about earlier with, with all the witchcraft shit and, and, uh, and uh, building sacrifices, stuff like that. Sometimes it was the, 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 the smoke come from the from the chimney um, of the neighbor's house. That alone was enough to make the neighbor go crazy and think that a dragon has been sent to steal from him, maybe steal a chicken or steal the eggs, which he ate himself because he was fucking drunk or I don't know. But there was a reason to say my neighbor sent me a dragon and he stole my money and he stole my eggs and he stole my fucking chicken and or or the neighbor he wants to bring me a big misfortune so he sent me a dragon of course back then i don't remember the name sorry guys um i will look it up and maybe um uh, tell you <laughs> next time or or or, or uh brenda will tell you the, the the name it wasn't called dragon back then but they used a term similar to dragon and from that the name dragon originated so because Dragons didn't always have a defined appearance. People didn't always have a clear image of what a dragon was. Of course, the concept developed much later. The term dragon was also used to describe a thunderstorm, bad weather, associating it with fire and natural disasters, stuff like that. That was a dragon back then. I'm talking about the days when nature religions and, and the people pray to the nature spirits or talk to the nature spirits was was one with nature dragons that was dragons thunderstorm lightning dragons those were fucking dragons um of course what's fascinating is the fact that uh, um there are narratives about dragons in in many cultures of, of, of worldwide We've talked about it and here we are talking about real physical beings that um people claim to have seen so back to what I said uh, in the beginning, <laughs> the same we, we, we mentioned when we talked about hell and, and heaven and devils, maybe there were enough people who pictured dragons like that and at one point they existed and then they disappeared again. I don't, I know it's wild, it's wild, it's not even a real theory, right? It's, it's your thoughts, but and it's wild, I know it's wild, it sounds wild, but... Hey, why not? Everything is possible, man. I believe that everything is possible. No, it's totally possible. And then you think of maybe that's this exodus of species, you know, this idea that the Mayans just up and went somewhere. Maybe, you know, one of their sponsors in the, I don't know, lands of Arcadia or something out there across the ice wall picked them up and they said, hey, we've been watching you guys for a long time. We want you to come hang out with us at our place. And maybe they're the ones that influenced them to build the way that they did, formed a relationship and said, hey, actually... Uh, the planet's kind of shit, or that realm is kind of shit, but these people are there, all right, I vouch for them. And then maybe pick them pick them up and move on with some of these civilizations that do these mass exodus and, and stuff like that, these migration again of species, that it's called maybe dragons just flew the fuck over the ice wall, you know, and um, landed somewhere else, and they kind of freely move. Or maybe this place changes constantly and pushes uh, environmentally people out to other realms, and then now this realm is then recycled for something new, but it can't get rid of everything. It's like uh, killing every cockroach. It's like 
at some like something hid under a rock or in a mountain somewhere and it's got some crevice that it's found and then uh, maybe it was pregnant and then you know it's like all these different scenarios where you think about and then you apply this to like bigfoot and all that kind of stuff and something i wanted to wrap back to before i let you go uh would be this idea of patterns and the phenomena and i just spoke of bigfoot have you heard of that women around bigfoot create a different reaction than if it's only men have you heard about this Oh, that's why I've, no, I never heard about that. Interesting. It, yeah, Alexander Petikoff, amazing dude. He's actually coming to our event to speak and everything. Um, he talks about that uh, these stories in Alaska where these guys will note that if they have a woman with them on their team tracking Bigfoot or out even just camping or something, that they'll hear more baby crying noises in the woods than if they're just men by themselves, they don't hear baby crying noises. It's almost like it entices women specifically to hear a baby crying and to want to venture out to see what it is in that wild sort of like sirens that will um bay at um sailors and stuff right it's what the dudes want they want to get some and so it, it calls to them in this very loving soothing way from a female voice that enchants them it almost knows what they want sort of a thing or what will lure them it's almost like angler fish you know angler fish they have the little bulb on them and then that yeah. attracts everybody it, it's kind of wild it's almost like the same concept in my mind i just found that pattern in the phenomena pretty interesting it's very interesting. I never heard about that. That's, that's very interesting. Alexander, he's great. You should totally have him on. We'll, uh, I'll get you. I got you. Yeah. Uh, what you said before with the Mayans, also very interesting. Um, what's also bizarre is uh, an interesting um, um, is that at some point in time, um, humans were drawn intensively underground. And that's, 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 that's wild. And there are stories about the Mayans also that, that, that they, they protected their their um stuff from i don't know people that attacked them underground and built these fucking giant underground uh, tunnels in south america man they're wild if you if you hear about these uh, tunnels in south america these underground tunnels how big and long and wide they are it's crazy man it's it's, it's really crazy and here in germany as well in austria uh, there are many so-called um it's called Erdstelle in, in, in Deutsch, in German, Erdstelle, um, like uh, earth stalls or, or earth stables. Um, these are in, in, in part long tunnel systems, which generally very narrow passages through which only a single person can pass. Yeah. No one knows exactly what purpose they were and, and uh, created and, and by whom. Nobody knows who built these earth stalls. Dating them has uh, proven difficult for some reason, but yet they exist. What adds to the mystery is the fact that many of them were constructed in a very impractical manner. Um, who builds an underground tunnel system where nothing can be stored, right? Or no one can hide for a, for a longer time or, or, or linger and where nobody can be buried or nobody has been buried down there. So what's the purpose of these? Um, I told you about the resonance chambers also misty resonance chambers man it's crazy it's so wild and i don't know raises so many questions um there's a story about small people here about dwarves in germany um whether there's any truth to it or not i don't know but if you go far back in in history we encounter homo floriensis the smallest human species uh, we've ever known i mean they were, they were said to be around, I think, three feet tall, even though they're likely only inhabited uh, in, in the islands of Flores. We don't know if we had a population here, too, similar to them. Yeah. But that's a whole nother story, man. Um, Dude, it gets crazier and crazier. The more we look at yeah. this place, the more we, um, you know, come to these conversations, the more fascinating it gets. I mean, like today, you you were able to come by and tell us not only your incredible story, man. I mean, it's fascinating, the triangle UFO, the paranormal things you've been experiencing, but also about some things over there where you're at, which next time we come on, brother, man, we're going to set up um, a chat to uh, so stay on after, if you don't mind, uh, for a Patreon hangout. Those are a lot of fun, dude. The whole crew gets to hang out. We have a conversation, then they do sort of a question and answer thing after. They're badass, man. So linked below is all the ways to sign up for that, guys. If you want to join us, linked below as well is all the way to find our buddy Daniel Beckman here. Flying Chariots, The Rise, is his, your YouTube, your Facebook. Our conversation, of course, um, on your show will be linked below. Any other way uh, that you want to be found will be down there as well. So l let's say this, my friend. Uh, leave us on a high note. Leave us on something that gives you hope and keeps you moving forward because we talked about walling people up today. So what, what do you got, man? Leave us on a high note. 
Yeah, man. Even though we talked about some very dark um, aspects of history today, like walling in people and uh, a little girl, man, that's fucked up, I know, but... All this stuff teaches us something, right? And it gives us stuff to think about and understand where we came from, maybe where we're heading. It's still an interesting journey, even if we talk about fucked up things like, like, like that. I love this journey. I love to talk about um, very uh, inspiring minds like yourself and um, I love whom I met throughout my journey. Whether it's the German channel or the two German channels or the English speaking channel. I love um, the stories uh, I had the chance to hear. Man, I don't know what, to, what else to say. It's, it's, it's great time to be alive. Like I said, it's great time to be alive. <laughs>